while they're not speaking. Okay. Except for our interpreters. Good morning. Okay. May I start? Yeah? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Please enter the interpretation channel. Uh, I'm Abel Bianco, and I'm going to speak in Spanish. Please enter English if your language is English. Enter Spanish if your language is Spanish. Please, por favor, cada una entre en el canal de interpretación de su Please idioma. Choose an interpretation icon, the English channel or Spanish channel, whatever language you speak or you feel more comfortable with. Otherwise, you won't be able to listen to this inter simultaneous interpretation. Good morning. Good afternoon or good evening, I should say to everyone. Greetings from Argentina. I'm Mabel Bianco and I represent the um, Foundation on Research and Studies on Women. And I'm a member of the group promoting uh, foreign policies, feminist foreign policies that is developing the International Center for Research on Women along with a broad group of organizations, governments, and some agencies as well. It is an honor for us, along with the group of India, to be able to host this event, this session, simultaneously between two continents with different aspects, backgrounds, but that in terms of foreign policy are aiming at the same uh, ideas, goals, and we're promoting them. And having with us Lyric Thompson from the International Center for Research on Women, uh, who is the, an inspiration for us, it's a great opportunity for us as well. Why a feminist foreign policy is the question. We have been developing this um, from countries of the north because it started in Sweden, but it has uh, continued in other countries, especially from Europe and then also Canada. However, for countries of the global south, countries that are emerging, that are developing, it's also, this is also important because feminism proposes an equality of opportunities and real access to rights. That as long as they are expressed in terms of policies within our countries must also be reflected in the policies towards our foreign policy. That is to say, just as it's happening right now in the ongoing discussions of the of a Greek conclusions document. So we see that at this point in time at the CSW and the uh, CSW I mean, commission, a committee, there's a huge and major difficulty in finding consensus regarding terms that for us advocates of women's rights are fundamental and key and actually, these are rights on which we have made progress. However, there are still countries that do not acknowledge these and want to go backwards. Uh, so as long as there are foreign uh, feminist foreign policies that may be adopted in these countries, this may be translated into a certain coherence between what should be domestic policies and foreign policies. Of course, there are still countries where when you look into their own domestic policies, there is no egalitarian access to women's rights and uh, girls' rights. But still, 
this should be a goal and aim because Beijing 25 years ago, 26 this year, gathered us, summoned us and allowed for us to find a document with consensus that we still find hard to reach. So we must not go backwards. We must not uh, make any step backwards, especially now in times of COVID, where we have actually seen and attested to the fact that inequality is undeniable at this point. We are actually uh, facing evidence and proof as of the pandemics. Uh, to, at a point in time where we can say that under privileged groups, that is uh, women, children, girls and teen and youths are the most affected. So in this regard, we are called to have and we are forced to have and take a stance in which we cannot leave women, girls, youths behind. This is something that we must strengthen. and. These foreign policies, these feminist foreign policies are in turn the ones that cover all of the scenario regarding uh, rights in, across all fields. So it's not just in specific fields of gender equality as may be uh, elimination of violence against girls and women. Uh, we're talking about, for example, also climate change. So. We as women need to be there as well with our position and stances advocating uh, in favor and to protect climate change. And not just as a mere uh, way to comply to norms, but as an opportunity for every country across the globe, for us women to have access to this scenario and may be able to actually be able to achieve be able to achieve a true status of change where we may have the situation of not leaving any women who are actually or currently working in rural areas who are farmers who are indigenous uh, women they also should have a voice and should have a space to raise their demands, especially in regards to climate change poured into the reality of each specific country. And we need to also end extractivism or extractivist activities that uh, activities that have put us in a position of persecution of Aboriginal communities as well. And they are not only persecuted or um, taken away from their ter uh, territories, but also criminalized. This is why they need a feminist foreign policy, in, especially in the countries of the global south, especially in the countries which have not had this level of development. And this is why today we want to address this topic with those leaders who are in a position to uh, fight in from their own governments for this because the side of having an increased participation of women what we are really interested in is looking into the content of these policies that we are trying to put forth and want to advocate for in this csw and of course we're going to uh, also advocate for this at the high level political forum and at each sphere where we are working uh, in and taking our voice. So this is my message. I want to thank you all for this possibility, for this opportunity. And unfortunately due to personal reasons, I'm going to uh, have to leave the session before it ends. I apologize for this. Uh, this is something that is outside of my uh, scope of possibilities. Uh, there was no way uh, I could change this, but uh, duty calls, but uh, there is a lot of uh, great experts. Uh, so please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mabel. Um, that was... Um 
given us lots of uh, things to think about. But before we go ahead, I'd like to first introduce uh, this excellent stellar panel that we have, um, um, as Mabel said, from across the globe. Uh, uh, I'm Ambika Vishwanath and I'm speaking on behalf of the Kubernetes Initiative and we're very excited to partner with Mabel and her team on this event. Um, at Kubernetes Initiative, we've been doing some research on what a uh, feminist foreign policy might look like from an Indian perspective. And so this is very exciting that not only do we have somebody from India to be able to speak about this, but also somebody from Jordan, Argentina and Mexico, which it's, it's a very interesting makeup because all, all these countries other than Mexico, all the other three countries other than Mexico haven't quite embarked on this path yet. And the whole conversation around a feminist foreign policy and more gender inclusion in our foreign policy is seen from, at this point, more countries in, uh, in Europe. So what is, it's really exciting to see what kind of uh, views uh, some of these other countries might have to change or to influence or to sort of bring different insights into that conversation and how we might then make this conversation a lot more inclusive going forward. So um, I'd like to introduce our panel um, and then invite our panel members to say a few words before we then open it up to, to questions um, from the audience. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Christopher Valdez and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, to speak first. Um, he's from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Was that, was that all right? Um, and then we have uh, Ms. Ana Emilia Sarabeirus, who's the Director of Women and Gender Affairs, also at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Argentina. Uh, Ms. Priyanka Chaturvedi, who's a Member of Parliament in India. And Dr. Maisun Zubi, uh, international water security expert and former Secretary General, Ministry of Water Affairs in Jordan, and a very good friend of mine. So I'm very pleased to have my soon on this panel because she and I have worked in this space in the Middle East for many years before. So it's a very different and interesting perspective that I'm excited to hear. But I'd like to invite Dr. Christopher here um, to speak first. Um, especially since Chris, uh, Mexico is the first country, so to speak, in the global south to embark on this path. And we'd like to hear more about where Mexico came from um, when they decided to, to embark on this path. And what are some of the lessons that you've learned um, as, a, as a country? And, and what are some of the insights that you can give then some of the other countries that might be looking to sort of join this conversation and this movement? Dr. Christopher. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to join Mabel's invitation to speak in Spanish, if you, should you agree? So, and especially, I'm, I'm really glad to share this panel, especially with countries that don't usually speak about feminist foreign policy. And for us, this is really important. So I'm going to change to Spanish now. Buenos días a todas. Good morning, everyone. It's a true pleasure to be here uh, as part of this panel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that feminist foreign policy in Mexico was launched during the 74th Assembly of uh, UN by uh, Chancellor Marcelo Brad. The announcement that he gave was actually a commitment the country was taking on, firstly, to uh, take into consideration the voices of women, and secondly, to continue with the tradition of foreign policy in Mexico that is focused on human rights and gender equality. Along with this, part of the new uh, narratives of the current administration in terms of foreign policy refer in the first place to an opening to international scrutiny. Secondly, to the promotion of the highest standards in terms of human rights. Thirdly, to give priority to groups that have been historically forgotten, and that is vulnerable groups. And number four, uh, use multilateral tools as an efficient and effective tool in order to sort out problems that are common to different states. So given this commitment in January 2020, and after consultation rounds with several countries, and I want to thank here Lyric, uh, Lyric Thompson for her role, especially to gather all countries um, who had a feminist foreign policy or who were on a road or on a path to 
launch one to have a, a conceptual framework all also to use this as a reference and to have an implement our female, feminist foreign policies so in this regard in january 2020 uh, mexico officially launched its F fp and alongside there was a commitment to adopt a, a gender perspective of the actions that are made regarding our foreign policy, but beginning a coherence process, a domestic coherence process on trying to take these elements to all uh, on acting from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs outwards. So this is a group, a cluster of principles, and this is important because many times we understand foreign policies as goals or governmental actions. But in the case of Mexico, we've seen this as a group of principles. And in this regard, it's important to name this because principles show the access for action for all other activities from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, rather than focusing on specific actions, which of course, in the case of Mexico's derived from these principles. So what we're trying to do is change the baseline for actions of all our foreign uh, policy, and of course, the acting of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And there are five main points. Firstly, a gender perspective plus, that is to say, we focus not only on gaps or uh, typical discriminations that women face, but also on other groups, just such as LGBT communities. Another one that we call parity is visible. We need to find ways to ascribe visibility on women's capital and not just uh, assume this. We need to show this, we need to sh grant visibility. Also the eradication of all sorts of violence that have to do with acting uh, domestically, that is for us not to have any violence within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because it's impossible for us to state we're going to promote non-violence outwards, but we still live that on the inside of our structure. So, and also promote this for all and protect all Mexicans living abroad, women Mexicans living abroad. So, as I was saying in our second uh, point, we also need to address parity across all levels. And finally, and this is important, we needed to have a cross-sectional focus or approach uh, on all actions for of foreign policy, not just those touching or tapping on human rights, but also including those that have to do with economic foreign policy, uh, corporate, international cooperation foreign policy, cultural foreign policy, sports for foreign policy, etc. in Mexico. So in this regard, Mexico becomes the first country of what we call the global south in including a feminist foreign policy. And in this respect, we try to also elevate or raise the standards of what traditionally was seen as an open foreign policy. So we looked at our pairs and see that they focus on an international uh, foreign policy with gender perspective, but still set aside other elements that are important in order to create coherence when creating a feminist foreign policies such as parity, eradication of violence, and especially an, a cross-sectional focus or approach. So this is important for us and we can start by naming different success stories within our feminist foreign policy. Firstly, that our pairs in Latin America have seen this as a good practice and have gotten closer to Mexico uh, to see how they can include one. Hence, we are really happy to be part of this panel to be able to share with countries that still lack this type of foreign policy. Secondly, it's a commitment that uh, Mexico is taken along with its foreign, uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we grant visibility to this as it's an open commitment and then forces us to have the highest standards on matters of gender issues, especially in negotiations, uh, and Mabel was mentioning this, uh, CSW. We need to be progressive. We need to be um, of uh, top notch. We need to show the highest standards. Hence, this does not only have to do with Mexicans' activities or actions, but with multilateral actions with other countries for us to reach to better conclusions. It also has to do with uh, including inside the feminist foreign policy, one of the important sayings of UN that is not leaving anyone behind. And in this regards, it's important to include all elements that are necessary in order to enable 
all women's and girls' rights. And in this regard, all of our negotiations have a focus on gender, but we do this in all fora, not just in CSW. We also do this in the Council on Human Rights and also on other subject matters such as Cairo Plus 20 um, and population topics where you discuss all other issues regarding sexual and reproductive health and rights in women's and uh, women and girls. So we um, believe that by announcing a feminist foreign policy calls for a domestic reflection first and then a bet on the commitment from all governments to be uh, progressive and to look into progress. So at the end of 2019, during the development of the uh, party's um, conference on climate change, number 25th, taken, uh, taken place in Madrid, Mexico placed as one of its elements human rights and especially on the advancement of uh, gender policy in negotiations. So the role and leadership of Mexico was highlighted, not just by our peers in the government, but also by the civil society organizations. And also seeing how it's uh, possible by one government to uh, lead this movement and reach conclusions that may benefit uh, all other countries. So. Uh, we reach the inclusion of a gender perspective and hence the relevance of a country alongside other uh, countries include this variable to move forward on these issues. So I know we have very, uh, I mean, time constraints, but all of these elements from our ex Mexican experience can be of good use for all of you. And especially one, those countries who want to include a foreign, a feminist foreign policy and two, for all members of the civil society to better understand the role of a foreign policy in the advancement of rights of girls and women. So I would really like to now give the floor to all other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Christopher, also for um, sticking to the time. That's always um, welcome. Before um, I move on as, as a, a power given to me as a moderator, I'd like to ask one question to you, um, and then I'd like to move on to, to our panel member from India. You mentioned um, domestic reflections first, and I think that's very, that's very important because a lot of the countries um, present over here are, are, are sort of grappling with this issue of how do we talk about you know, a feminist foreign policy when we have so many issues at home, whether it comes to you know, gen um, gender pay gaps or violence or um, several other issues, especially that we've seen cropping up in the last year, especially. So I, what is the one learning that you might, and I'm sure there are plenty, but what is the one learning um, or, or sort of takeaway that you might want to share with um, the other panel members and then everybody else who's listening over here on, on what this means of, of having a domestic reflection um, and how you put that into practice. Muchas gracias. Uh, es, las reflexiones Thank you very ser... much. The reflections should be, should remain constant because we must admit this. Uh, international negotiations tend to go faster than the capacities of the government to address the issues uh, in terms of women's rights. And in that regard, having a feminist foreign policy calls for attention between what it's the external affairs and internal affairs. So it pushes governments to search for greater standards and of course, uh, greater actions. And this is very complex because up to now, no country can speak about Sust substantial equality between women and girls. But what is important is to give steps that imply pushing governments to be consistent and adopt better measures that would benefit girls and women. This is not something simple because uh, international negotiations have certain dynamics and inter domestic affairs has a different dynamic. So we should have, to, we must acknowledge that there are tensions and that we are working together, but in, but ultimately we work for, to make a world better for women and girls. So domestic uh, reflections tend to vary. Uh, they lead to tensions within the government and the social stakeholders. 
but it's something natural. It's, uh, but we believe that it's worth trying. So in that regard, we think it's important to do it. And we acknowledge at the same time that there are certain sessions and challenges at national level, but we need to start from somewhere uh, to achieve um, uh, gender equality. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's, um, yeah, as you said, very complicated, but definitely a path to embark on. Uh, I'd like to now bring this discussion to my side of the world and invite Ms. Priyanka Chaturvedi to, to, to give her thoughts on what this might look like or what this means um, from, from an Indian perspective. And, and if you could um, pick up a little bit on what Dr. Christopher also said about this um, sort of balancing out what it the, the whole domestic issues versus what is happening when it comes to our foreign policy, because India does have a pretty good um, sort of, um, when it comes to our ODA uh, and putting a gender balance in that, it's, it's we're, we're faring pretty good, not always by design, sometimes by default, um, but how do we then create that balance? And if India were to embark on this path of a feminist foreign policy, what might that look like? Okay. Uh, yes. Firstly, firstly, thank you so much, Ambika, for having me uh, as part of this important panel on gender equity and uh, talking about feminist foreign policy, which does not necessarily need to do uh, something with regards to, uh, you know, women leading the change, but it is something to do with women having a voice, having an agenda, and women uh, having equal representation. And that is where I think, and inherently over the years, because I come from a part of uh, the world where inherently over the years, women are made to believe, conditioned to believe uh, that they are not meant for tougher roles. And tougher roles would mean defense, uh, diplomacy, and diplomacy, even if we're talking about diplomacy, foreign affairs, we're looking at it at a very junior level where we are talking about soft power, using a soft power. And in our minds as women, uh, tending to believe that uh, we are meant for the soft decision-making skills, human resources, uh, uh, equations with the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera, but not taking these tough decisions or tough calls, which is predominantly a male domain. But that has harmed us uh, considerably and uh, harmed our gender considerably, because if you look at the gender gap index, if you look at our representation in various foras, it is much lesser than the rest of the world. And that is why I think Empirical research would tell you that uh, whenever we have more women in these spaces, it helps the economy, it helps social development of a society, and it helps build up communities as far as security and development of a nation is concerned. So I quite agree with Dr. Christopher when he says, first, if we maintain an internal balance, we strive to work towards that. We strive to bring in more representation in our own workspaces. And we uh, pull down those barriers that have been built over the years that there is a softer role that women can do in foreign diplomacy. There are tough decisions that women can't take. That has to go. That, that is what you need to pull down. And But these countries, like I appreciate what Sweden's doing. I appreciate what Canada is doing. US is looking towards that. We have quite a lot of representation in the new US government. Uh, we're seeing it in Mexico. But we, they cannot, as a, as a globe, and as various countries are part of uh, democracies, as well as, uh, you know, as part of the world, we need to ensure that half of this world's population also has a voice, also feels safe, also has control over her own choices. And I come from India, and India, if you look at the South Asia uh, region too, South Asia region too has also seen uh, women uh, being, um, I would say, made to believe that they are not good enough, they, they're not, uh, they do not have enough representation, percentage of representation in political spaces, very low. Uh, unfortunately, even the, the UN report suggests that uh, women will be pushed into poverty due to COVID lockdown. So those are various uh, factors that have, and then the domestic violence of it all has also created uh, challenges for women to take forward. So if as a whole, uh, you know, I would say as the universe or as the countries who form a part of uh, this discussion, we need to stop working in silos and appreciate some other countries. While we appreciate other countries, we need to incorporate this within our own nations. 
And I think it would do India a whole lot of good if we have more representation. It is a dichotomy that have, is in India that uh, we have witnessed in India that India sees, uh, has seen the first uh, woman prime minister, we've seen president, we've seen speakers, we've seen foreign minister, we've seen defense minister. But how does that percolate down in terms of representation is very dismal. So if we look at it from the perspective of how we lead in terms of uh, gender equality globally, I think India, and when we give more power to women, there is another thought process also that comes into how we resolve differences, we resolve foreign policy challenges, defense challenges. It is not just about war and peace. It is something that we do when there is no war. During peace times is more hard work. And I think women would complement that entire uh, space. And, I, and that is why it becomes a bigger case for India to lead from the front and um, take this entire initiative forward. So I would all, all I'd like to uh, say this before I conclude is that uh, as 50% of the world's population, it is imperative that we just do not have these dialogues, rather we move in that particular direction and take lead in at least South Asia to uh, be able to show that gender equality can also lead to some real time solutions and solutions which um, could be different, could be out of the box, because, simply because women have not been hurt till now in these spaces. So giving them that power, that authority to be able to do that. And I quite agree with Dr. Christopher on most of the points he's made as far as having women in representational spaces is concerned and decision-making spaces is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Trivedi. I, um, I agree. I think during peace, the, the job becomes a lot harder. And, and what can we do then to, to elevate that space and to create um, more space for the voices to be able to come in um, becomes the real challenge. Um, I have many questions to you, but I'm first going to go to um, Miss Anna Emilia. Uh, Sarah Beirus, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, to tell us what the view looks like from Argentina. I know there's been a lot of movement, especially since the, the huge march that happened in 2015, where thousands of women took to the streets, um, along with a lot of men also, but predominantly women. And there's been some change happening in Argentina. So what um, can you tell us about what's happening over there? And again, the same question to you as to what are some of the lessons that other countries might be able to learn from the changes that are happening within Argentina? Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you who are in the East. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Mabel Bianco from FEIM. Thank you, uh, Kubernetes Initiative. And of course, uh, thank you, ICRW. And thank you for the question, actually, because as of what uh, Dr. Christopher mentioned, I, I was able to reorganize my intervention. And I think we have some sort of complementary, if you will, a situation. As you know, since uh, 2015, as of a major mobilization of the civil society and feminist movements in Argentina, women uh, took on the streets and took to the streets. Uh, this means that uh, the last administration, that government um, of Dr. Alberto Fernandez, and when he took uh, office, he translated this uh, mobilization in favor of uh, women's rights, but actually uh, in favor of life itself, because not one, uh, not one more means no one more femicide. Um, no, we don't want any more feminicide. So um, Dr. Fernandez created a ministry of gender and uh, diversity, given visibility to this claim and demand from all feminist movements and organizations. In turn, two, three months after this, as of the onset of pandemics, he also created the National Cabinet for the cross-sectionality uh, of all gender perspectives and policies. And with this, there was a triggering of all the national states in this challenge of um, making all gender policies cross-sectional towards the interior of these 20 ministries for the issues of women, uh, not just to remain restricted to one, to the new ministry for the first time in the history of Argentina. That is this ministry of uh, women, gender and diversity. So with this, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
is walks alongside this new charge and i am under the super uh, in the supervision position by creating different competencies that is there was a directorship of the women now it's women and gender issues and we receive all uh, missions and functions of the from the ministry of women gender and diversity with the idea of projecting this to the world so we understand foreign policy as a reflection of domestic policies of what a society should be uh, and argentina as a pluralistic diverse and democratic society for several years now we are transmitting as a foreign policy this gender policy with this footprint, if you will. So in this regard, and since the um, uh, Directorate of uh, Women, Gender and Diversity uh, Ministry was created, we've been having different uh, um, functions from the new, uh, yes, from the changing in the language to address all sorts of diverse women towards uh, uh, parity and the first time in the um, foreign policy, that there is a parity to all positions, that is, Madam Ambassador, Madam Minister, etc. So a cross-sectionality of all gender perspectives across the foreign, min, uh, foreign Affairs Ministry. And this was materialized in this past uh, March the 8th that states that all activities, actions and missions performed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, both from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or the 160 um, branches need to have a gender perspective, indicating, because when we say gender perspective, many times this is not clear, especially taking into account that uh, people have been ex in power for 30 years with a certain uh, very, I mean, rooted uh, perspective of what it should be. So it describes gender perspective as the uh, allocation of functions with any gender stereotypes, uh, type stereotyping. We call for a parity representation in terms of international festivals, culture festivals, trade missions, business missions, in any sort of seminar, in any event, uh, we uh, instruct all embassies and uh, ministries and external offices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a parity composition, that is equal representation. So in um, last uh, March the 8th, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs created the gender observatory, observatory sorry, that works within the gender focal point um, area that was reactivated last year. And the first mission has to do with this, that is identifying barriers. So that is identifying barriers that hinder careers of women working in uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also moves on the identification of violence or gender-based violence. So, and I don't really want to uh, run over time, but we have a national context, a national scenario, and as you probably know, there are three laws that we, are, we take pride in, that is uh, Micaela Law that prompts all public offices of all three branches to train in gender perspective and against gender violence. Then the um, gender identity law that allows all individuals to be identi identified and to be given a name as of the identity they call, that they, they choose to have. And then the legal and, um, legal and free right to abortion uh, that consolidates the right of women to decide on something as basic as their own bodies. So this is a national context, the national scenario right now. And we are taking this through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the international sphere. And this is where I m create the link to what Dr. Christopher was saying. It's utterly important to have these allies, uh, these friends or like miners as we call them, in uh, international fora 
in order to bring consideration of gender perspective and especially on substantial equality across genders to all fora, not just traditional human rights uh, fora, not just CSW or the Human Rights Council. We're working at uh, the FAO, we're working this at uh, OECD, we are working on all trade agreements, bilateral agreements. We have a um, common, we have a TLC in Mexico as well, um, free trade agreement in Mexico. We have different types of agreements. So I think that it also happens with teams and the economic uh, business sphere. It's a masculine, it's a, masculine oriented or male oriented sphere so after so many years when we had only two female um, ministers of foreign affairs and then we we find that it's very difficult to bring down this structure so when you say having a feminist foreign policy we do have a certain footprint of foreign uh, feminist policies in Argentina, we are making a strong and stable uh, movement forward if you want in this parity path, because this is indeed an instruction and uh, an order within uh, uh, what in terms of foreign policy and within all fora, but we believe that parity is not enough. Feminist foreign policy calls for a certain or different approach. We need we need for uh, the policy to be built from a feminist perspective. Feminist poses equality. Feminism poses uh, the bringing down of uh, of hierarchies, social hierarchies, and also the ways uh, of the different ways of organization. And this last second national plan for action of the 1325 was done in a feminist way. It was built the feminist way because it involves 10 ministries and many areas of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well. We had several meetings. All of the voices were listened to. Uh, civil society was there. The academia was there as well. Um, women's movements were there. Women movements were there as well. We all made our contributions on identifying actions we believed could serve to uh, meet this resolution. So this month we're going to submit it and uh, I don't really want to continue uh, with my intervention because I'm really interested in, in learning about the other interventions and, and, and STEM in debate as well. So I coincide and agree with my colleague from Mexico. We appreciate from Mexico having taken the lead of uh, starting in this feminist foreign policy. It's a uh, very use, very useful for us because we have an attempt of domestic feminist, for, uh, feminist policy. And having Mexico as an ally in those fora allows us to go across borders and beyond our borders with this perspective. So of course I thank him and I believe that clearly, as I was saying before, uh, parity is key. It is absolutely necessary in decision-making processes, in representation, in all spheres in order to think from a different perspective, but it's not enough. Parity is not enough. We need to build from the grassroots of politics that may be different. We want to change everything, basically. The world as is right now is not working well. Um, so clearly, as Mabel was saying, we need to get out of this uh, cumulative extractivist model and then deconstruct this higher social hierarchy. So, that's where we are, are right now, along this path. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Sarah Beros. There's um, very interesting points you raised over here. And I, and I see uh, Ms. Chaturedi was um, nodding along because to let you know, she 
recently in the parliament also made an intervention about some of the specific issues that you talked about, especially um, a woman's rights to her own body. So I feel like there's a lot for, for the two of you to speak about. Um, and, I, and, I, and I especially want to highlight what you talked about um, bringing a gender perspective across all ministries. Uh, I think that's very important because unless we are able to do that within our own countries across the board, ha just having one ministry that deals with this issue doesn't necessarily mean it's going to trickle across our policy making frameworks um, um, when it comes to other areas, um, like you mentioned, economics or defense, security uh, and, and other areas. Um, but so that I don't take up more time, I'm gonna to come to our last um, speaker for this panel before we then, there's already some very interesting questions that are coming up. Um, but I wanna uh, pick up on something that you said about taking the lead and uh, ask uh, Maisun from Jordan, if that is something that Jordan might be able to do in, in the region that it's in, giving some of the internal issues that I know um, Jordan has as well, not unlike what's happening in Argentina or in India when it comes to um, you know, the issues faced by women, violence, uh, pay gaps, um, and then Jordan has the added problem of, of, um, of conflict um, and refugees uh, that are in there. So there's a whole host of other different um, problems that Jordan is facing, but given some of its uh, um, progression in the last few years, um, maybe Jordan is poised to take the lead um, in, in that region. Uh, my soon to you. Thank you, Ambika. Uh, I'm truly grateful to receive this honor and be part of this uh, effort. Thanks for the, all the important work being carried out to enable women's participation in conflict prevention, peacekeeping, pre prevention of violence, extremism, and gender-based violence. Countries that value and empower women to participate fully in decision-making are more stable, prosperous, and secure. The opposite is also true. When women are excluded from negotiations, the peace that follow is more tenuous, the trust is eroded, and the human rights and accountability are often ignored. According to the data from the Council on Foreign Relations, between 1992-2019, women constitute on an average 13% of negotiators, 6% of mediators, and 6% of signatories in major peace processes around the world. Worldwide, the proportion of peace agreement with gender equality provision increased from 14 to 22% from 1995 to 2019. In South Sudan, only two committees have met the 35% of quota for women laid out in the Batalai's agreement on the, revolution, on the resolution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan. Peace efforts in 2020 have similarly, similarly struggled to include women. For example, women represented in around the world 10% of negotiators in Afghan talks, just 20% of negotiators in Libya's political decision discussions, and 0% of negotiation in Libya military talks and Yemen recent protests. These numbers haven't improved significantly since the adoption of landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325. In the MENA region, women in the MENA region face gender legal discrimination than women elsewhere, with differential laws on issues such as marriage, freedom of movement, as well as limited, maybe no legal protection from domestic violence. Regional condition, in addition to base discrimination, contribute to significant differences between men and women's participation in MENA economies. Even though women's participation in, is recognized and prerequisite for sustainable peace and inclusive societies, some countries in the MENA region still lag far behind in women's participation in public sphere. MENA contributes perform poorly as compared to the world average when it comes to the percentage of seats held by women in legislative body. 10.4% of seats were held by women Men compared to 24%, 24.3% globally, and the 23% to 6 in the United States. Looking at women representation and participation in peacemaking processes, both the state and UN system in MENA have yet walked the talk in terms of increasing women participation in peace processes. In 2014, 
None of the delegation with which participated in Geneva Conference 2 in Syria included women. Additionally, in 2015, the global average of women in peacekeeping mission has remained at 4%, per similar percentages to the registered for the, U, for the four UN peacekeeping mission in Middle East and North Africa. Women are underrepresented in political, political position and institution in MENA region to a greater extent than they are in most of the world. For example, some, women, some governments and political parties have attempted to improve the women representation in legislative bodies by implementing gender quota. Eight countries in the region have some form of quota to ensure women's representation. And those countries have more women seated in lower houses of legislature than MENA average. 2015 was an important year for women and girls. The world celebrated the anniversary of Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, adopted by the Security Council in 2000. This landmark resolution was the first initiative that highlighted the need for women's part uh, protection from all forms of violence in conflict, as well as their full inclusion. In My son, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but yeah. the interpreters are asking if you can um, speak a little slower so it's easier okay. for them to do the Spanish translation. Okay, I yeah, thought I know I'll speak English. Okay, sorry. Even though Resolution 1325 creates a clear roadmap for the implementation of women, peace and security agenda, governments and international organizations have failed to put their commitment into practice. In the year 2015, yet another resolution was adopted. The resolution number 2242, which reinforces the importance of women's protection, leadership, and active role in decision-making. Now I'll talk about selected milestone in the MENA region about women political representation. In 2011, Butaina Kamel became the first woman to run for president in Egypt. In 2011, Saudi Arabia became the last country in the world beside the Vatican to recognize women's right to vote following Oman, Qatar, Kuwait, and UAE. In 2014, Iraq adopted region's first national action plan in support of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women peace and security, followed by Jordan, Tunisia, Lebanon, and Yemen. In 2015, the UAE elected Dr. Amal al Khubaisi, the Speaker of the Federal National Council, the first woman to serve as a Speaker of legislative body in the Arab world. In 2018, Sarwa Abdel Wahid became the first woman to run for President in Iraq. In, June, in January 2019, Lebanon Rayal Hassan was appointed the first female Interior Minister in the Arab world. In February 2019, Princess Rima bint Bandar Al Saud became the first female ambassador to represent Saudi Arabia. In January 2020, Lebanese Zaina Akar became the first female minister of defense in Arab world. Now I talk about Jordan. Uh, Jordan women in Jordan constitute 47.1% of the total population in Jordan. The Women in Politics 2009 map ranked Jordan 132 out of 193 countries, mapping women's political participation in parliaments worldwide. This rank was achieved through the gender quota system adopted in 2003, where later revisions to the system increased to allocated seats for women from six to 15 parliamentary candidates as part of the 2012 electoral reform. Jordan ratified the revised convention in the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women in 2007. Women were granted the right for voting and candidacy for lower house and parliament and municipal village council in 1947 and 18, 1982 respectively. The result of November 2020, Jordanian parliamentary votes were disappointed as only 15 women were elected to the 130 deputy house of representative down from 20 in the outgoing body. Female candidates faced losses and for the first time in the decade, failed to win a seat outside the 15 seat quota. This confirms on the Jordanian political scene 
increasing women representation is not a priority. The decision makers do the minimum to show that support women representation in decision making position, but it is not enough. The quota system adopted in Jordan 2003 has helped some women enter parliament, but the political role of women of Jordanian women is still limited, although they, they constitute about 52% of the voters. In Jordan today, many women enjoy the position in company, the organization, government institutions. There are, there are female ministers, highly qualified doctors, engineers, businesswomen, and other professionals who command influence roles in, the, in every walk of life. Yet, there are next to none in women in labor and professional association councils. Despite the women make up around 20% of professional association members with 17%, of Jordan Engineer Association, 19% in Jordan Bar Association, 20% uh, of Jordan Press Association, and uh, for the Pharmacist Association, 50%. You and women, in partnership with the government of Jordan, international partners, and civil society organization, continue to support the implementation of women peace and security gender to enable women participation in conflict prevention, peacekeeping, prevention of violence. The UN Women Program on Implementing the Jordanian National uh, Plan on UN on Security Council 1325 up after uh, follows the, the, gap, the cabinet approve, approval of Jordan first plan in December 2017 and its successful publication and launch in February 2018 aims to integrate gender-based approach towards women's participation in prevention and protection processes during in conflicts, as well as in peace building and maintaining stability, sustainable security. It's also reiterate the importance of engaging men and boys as partners in promoting women's participation, prevention, and resolution. This is a plan for advancing the implementation of UN Council 1325 of women and its subsequent resolution was developed to respond to the country-related security and military challenges. It is in line with Jordan's commitments to promote and respect of human rights, justice, equality, and participation, all of which are embedded in various national frameworks, such as National Strategy for Jordanian uh, Women, uh, the Comprehensive National Plan for Human Rights. So Jordanian women have so, uh, demonstrated considerable leadership in community and in formal organization, as well as public and private enterprises. However, socialism and negative stereotype of women and men reinforce the tendency for decision making to remain in the domain of men. I will talk about this last initiative. We're doing this. It is we call it empowering women in water diplomacy in Middle East and North Africa. It's a comparative study of Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and Palestine. The Global Water Partnership Mediterranean and the Geneva Water Hub joined forces, forces that beginning of 2020 and initiate collaboration on strengthening the role of women in water diplomacy with emphasis on Middle East and North Africa. The collaboration commenced in form of analytical mapping work on current status and challenges facing women in water diplomacy and transboundary water cooperation setting in the region and developed comparative study on empowering women through targeted outreach and dissemination activities the analytical work has evolved into an initiative aiming to support and strengthen the role of women involved in water diplomacy. The comparative study has compared the challenges to the attainment of more women decision makers in water diplomacy and transboundary water cooperation setting in five Arab countries in the five world, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, uh, Egypt, and Morocco. The focus of the comparative study has been to identify the similarities and differences in the challenges female water experts face across the, uh, across the five countries and identify capacity building needs in terms of the various scale of 21st century water diplomats. Obstacles the wom that women face are mainly threefold, negative stereotype, considerable gender pay gap, and social expectation that negatively influence the career choice, including the need for balancing family and professional life, fitting into existing social and simply struggle with the lack of self-confidence. The mapping result highlighted the need for targeting capacity building program, including the support and mentorship by more senior experts, both women and women. And sorry, maybe I speak too much, but I talk about Jordan and Middle East. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. 
Over thank to you. you. Thank you, Maisun. Um, yeah, I was uh, getting ready to tell you that our time was up because we have many questions um, and we'd like to get them to the panelists. Um, while I have many questions myself, I'm going to first bring a couple of them from our um, audience over here. Um, and, and add on to that. So Dia Nag from the Asia Foundation uh, that does some fantastic work in this space asks, um, what is the best way to move away from just paper compliance to actual implementation? Which I think is a very important question. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Christopher to say a few words on that given uh, Mexico's experience. Um, but I'm going to add on to this question um, and pick up something that my soon has said and that we've also learned from our research um, about, um, about, you know, quotas and representation and, and numbers. And is it enough to just have a certain number of women in your, whether it's your parliament or your foreign ministry or, or any sort of government or non-government body, um, or do we need to go beyond that now? Um, and, and is having, um, you know, 50% enough um, if they don't have a voice, um, Dr. Christopher? And then I'm gonna bring that question to you, um, Ms. Chaturvedi, because while India is the only country in this panel that doesn't have a national action plan for WPS, it's actually done some other interesting, um, uh, sort of gone in and on different other paths. So I'm gonna ask you that same question. So if you wanna take a few minutes to think about what that answer might be. Dr. Christopher. Thank you very much for this interesting question. Uh, gonna... thank, you for the... thank you very much for um, the question. It's important to consider that national processes are different. For some countries, it is important to start with quotas. Some others might find interesting to uh, start by parity, and some others are working with substantial issues. I highlight what Argentina mentioned. They are moving through quotas and parity uh, through their uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but what it's important and a central for uh, the CSW this year is not only do we need women, but we need women making decisions. And that's very important to highlight because that changes the perspective of how the elements are taken into account. Those elements are, are traditional, traditionally overlooked. Um, when it comes to developing the national plans uh, regarding W, SP, well, we need to consider a gender perspective. If women are being part of different activities that have to do with um, activities regarding uh, the military activities or to prevent peace, uh, if we don't consider their needs, we don't buy uh, supplies, we don't have elements for them in, cam in camps. It's something simple, but it's very important and it's overlooked. In the case of Mexico, we are mobilizing not only with quotas, but we're also talking about parity, but we also should move, mobilize and say, it's not, 50% is not enough women should be in decision-making positions where they can improve other women's lives. And that's essential. And that's the perspective we want to give to the feminist foreign policy in my country. We recognize the challenge, the challenges we have uh, nationally. And I will retake what Anna Emilia said. You have to start somewhere, but it's not all, only that. The pressure should come from both sides so that we can elevate your standards, raise your standards. It is known that standards are not raised because people are good. It's a, it, it, they, are, they stem from joint work. And we at the Ministry of Foreign Policy, we decided to take on our role and push to have consistency between the national policies and the international policies. And that's very important. Uh, right now, we are in the process of reforming the law of foreign policy of the foreign service to have at least three of the five actions that we consider as part of the feminist foreign policy. And we would like to thank uh, policymakers, female policymakers, 
because they are pushing to have this loss passed. Um, they are pushing to improve women's lives. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Christopher. I think that's a, um, that's a good way to look at it. It depends on the, your experience of the country also and which path that one wants to take. And, and that's an important message to the conversation um, and movement that's going around because as we've seen coming out of Sweden, Canada, France, Germany, and now the US, the way they're looking at it, it's all completely different. Um, there's no one size fits all, so to speak, happening. So, so that's kind of an important. Um, Ms. Chaturvedi, to you, but I'm going to add on a little bit because there's a very interesting question over here um, uh, from Jennifer Bonilla Lozano, um, who says, how do you see the role of parliaments in making sure that there is some sort of coherence between internal and external um, policies with the gender perspective? And I'm going to um, let you answer that, um, given your role in the parliament in India. So firstly, if I may begin on a lighthearted note, uh, I've become a fan of Dr. Christopher. Every single word he has spoken is such a refreshing thought coming from the male perspective, wanting parity for women and having not just women representation, 50% representation, giving women their voice and their decision-making space. So I'm a fan. And, uh, and it's a very refreshing change to see an entire he for she campaign. And this is where I think India would uh, do a lot well if we had 1,000 Christophers in India in these uh, decision-making spaces who uh, speak up for women and speak up so passionately for uh, re gender representation. Uh, on, a, on the other side of the debate uh, where India is concerned, uh, when our constituent assembly, which was again male dominated, but also had female representation, uh, when we decided that we, when we uh, give fundamental rights to all, there was equality in mind, and we believed that uh, the constitution would guarantee equal access, equal opportunities for, uh, you know, cutting across gender barriers. However, it did not happen, and that is when the quota system was implemented at local governance levels. Of course, there was criticism where they said that women are, there is representation like Dr. Christopher was saying, but there was not authority uh, that came along with it. Decisions were being taken on behalf of them by their uh, spouses. Um, so that was one challenge. However, if you look at the change that the quota has brought in, uh, you'd realize that we've got a lot more representation at local government levels. Uh, in spite and despite of all the barriers, the mindset that comes across that women won't be able to take these tough decisions, would not be able to survive the uh, rough and tough uh, political space, they, they've managed to hold on to their own and set really good examples. Uh, as far as parliament is concerned, I think parliament needs to be, women need to rise above their political differences. And I think it uh, applies globally that where women rise above their political differences, make this about gender, make this about representation, make this about having a collective voice. Until we don't speak together to have this kind of representation, I do not see uh, men making that space. We do not have Dr. Christophers in India, though they have the intent, but we do not have them in those decision-making spaces. We've had the prime minister speak about it. Unfortunately, we have not spoken about how we are going to increase this representation. So uh, in terms of political spaces, like uh, uh, positions uh, in political spaces we've seen in India, they have come from smaller regional parties uh, because we have a strong federal structure. Uh, we can uh, debate about federalism, et cetera, but we have a strong federal structure which has smaller parties and those parties have given representation to women of their own accord and managed to give women uh, political space and a political voice to be able to uh, speak up for women. But I also see a conscious change in, uh, uh, in India's conversation about women. And um, when we are talking about representation, I think every manifesto, political party manifesto speaks of having more women in these spaces, uh, having a quota for women in uh, jobs, in police forces, et cetera. Uh, but however, the, uh, you know, the true implementation of it would be a testimony to our intent. So those are spaces where we uh, definitely have to work a, along where we have he for she, where women, men do not look like us as, uh, as a gender which is suddenly asking for a lot more than they deserve, which is not correct. And which is uh, something that we have been brought to uh, believe as women, we need to speak up, we need to speak for our gender and rise above our political differences and make some positive policy initiatives only. And like you, I think, I think you mentioned this, 
that it has to be part of every ministerial focus. When we talk about internally bringing in the changes, then every ministry should be looking at more women representation. And that is how we'll be able to bring about a change where women will be confident uh, because they have authority and a voice to be able to raise and to execute. Um, thank you, Mr. Azmede. I think that that um, sort of uh, opens it up uh, when I'd love to, you know, continue this discussion for the next few hours. But I want to ask Miss um, uh, Anna, um, this uh, sort of a, um, a spin off of this question, you talked about um, the first step being the need to define gender. And I and I and I and I and I want to ask if you can elaborate a little bit on that, because the conversation again, while it's happening, there is also that tussle between using the word gender and the word feminism. And I want to ask, what has the experience been in Argentina? And why did Argentina decide to use the word gender? And what sort of definition did it sort of um, come up with? Maybe that is something that will aid then, you know, a country like India or Jordan or any of the others um, around the world that might want to embark on this path. Um, and, and move forward. Hello. So when I mentioned the definition of gender, I meant um, defining gender perspective. So we instruct um, embassies or, or directorates or um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs internally to have a gender perspective that is a dead um, thing if it's not if it doesn't go alongside some sort of training for colleagues to maybe able to identify and and see which those gender stereotypes are so when we say that functions should be assigned or allocated by virtue of the interest of people or the training that people may have and not based on gender stereotypes then we're saying do not give uh, an embassy to a woman because she may be more charismatic or because she may be she she may be empathic um, but rather give her that if she really earns that in in light of her training in light of her desires in light of her objectives because otherwise all cultural uh, venues are uh, probably headed by women and then political um, affairs or economic affairs or the head of mission is a man. So to bring down those gender stereotypes implies not just instructing them to do that, but rather explaining to them and then train them. And in this regard, since last year, we've been implemented uh, Micaela law and bringing it into the different ministries. That is to say training in gender perspective. We understand that gender is a social construct, different, different from differentiation between man and woman that exists in nature. That is biological difference for many years was loaded with a gender stereotype. That is to say every gender was given certain roles, social roles, that is what we call gender roles. And that is what has triggered or derived in these gender stereotypes and what we need to deconstruct or bring down from all different aspects or spheres, the uh, feminism in the streets from uh, foreign policy and then internally as well. So when we assign certain functions, it's just as what, what a colleague from India was saying, in terms of leadership roles, when we, the, the language is so key here also, when we look at the material with which we started 30 years ago, it was actually assigning leadership roles, management roles, executive roles to men, historical. Mr. President, um, Mr. Governor, uh, were all he terms. Uh, so mili military, uh, ministry, all roles were he roles. And gender uh, roles for teachers, nurses, uh, maids, nannies were all she roles. So that in turn 
builds a lot in terms of a mindset and perspective. So what we say is instruction from the executive branch is to assign functions without any gender stereotypes or beyond stereotypes. And that implies that from our uh, directorship, we train as of the excuse, so to speak, of the Michaela law to address gender-based violence towards a, a national state in the national plane, we train in gender perspective. That is, what is gender perspective? This is why, I mean, otherwise this goes down the drain. I mean, there is no substance uh, going, walking hand in hand. So we need to have this training. Does it, uh, Amika, does it answer your question? Yes. Yes, I, I, I also think it um, wants me now to ask a uh, hundred more questions, um, but we're going to invite uh, one of the questions that have come in the in Spanish, which I am not even going to try and read out uh, my colleague uh, Eva at from FEIM will read out one of our questions that have come in Spanish. Eva to you. Hola, hola a todos, a todas. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm going to read the question by Mireya, but I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her last name. She's asking that it's, it's important uh, the commitment with the gender and inclusion agenda and that the country's foreign policy should be consistent with the human rights of the population as a whole, and it should be applied internally. It is important, especially the commitment with the gender equality agenda. And her question is the following, which are the existing structures at that level to ensure and eliminate uh, discriminatory stereotypes because laws are not enough. They need they need our funds to be allocated in order to be implemented. I don't know who would like to answer that question. That's a, that's a great question. Yes, Dr. Christopher, if you want to say a few words about that, because um, it's actually something that hasn't come up too much um, in the last hour and a half that we've been talking is, is the whole financial aspect of all of this. Sí, muchas gracias. Aquí es Thank you very much. Uh, here it's important to highlight two things, including that uh, comprising that question and then are related to uh, another question, prior question. We have a feminist foreign policy that is part of a multilateral um, human right foreign policy. We don't understand a feminist foreign policy without considering an umbrella framework uh, in which the human rights are put at center stage. And Mexico wants to implement the highest standards and not only uh, to participate in international forum. We want th that participation to have an impact uh, within our countries. Otherwise, our international participation is useless. We should contribute internationally and nationally. And on the other hand, we innovated. And to the question, of when do you label something as gender or feminist a policy? When we discuss about this with ICRW, uh, with other countries that were building on this type of policies, some countries have a hard time talking about uh, feminism and they choose some more neutral terminology such as gender. And that has to do with uh, a certain dynamic which is important to highlight is that we want it in Mexico, we want it to go beyond that. And we have a feminist policy plus. What does that mean? That we should recognize other groups that traditionally have been discriminated against. We know that there's great debate within the feminist movement on how to include or not other groups um, such as the LGBT community. And this is something that we acknowledge if we did not include other groups 
that were discriminated against our feminist foreign policy would be would be missing something and so we should acknowledge that within our um, ministry and within our country uh, there are some other groups that have been traditionally discriminated and deserve to be recognized within the framework of human rights and in terms of uh, funds it's a complex debate and we also know that we understand that at times when we don't have money well when you're as we say in politics your priorities are reflected in your budgets what we want to say is that there are many policies or many government actions that can be done with zero budget and what do we mean by that that we should have a series of programs that are that oriented to elaborate a budget and here it's important what i mentioned before mexico's foreign policy is a set of principles therefore it's important to modify the structures and some may need a budget and some others may not need them not, not need that and that's a an internal debate in countries uh i'm paying a lot of attention to what india and jordan and are mentioning how this debate is taking place in the middle east and in asia and how these discussions are taking place in other countries where we are discussing social structures well it is important that we note not just by giving allocating funds we're going to change things we have to change the social structure as a whole because if it prevails well we are perpetuating old practices and we need to change that sometimes with direct action sometimes with budget and sometimes by changing principles and that's all i have to say um thank you dr christopher so the platform is going to end very soon so um before we close the event and i invite uh Lyric thompson from the icrw to, to say a few words i want to just come back to all our panelists um well, uh, Ms. Anna, uh, Ms. Chaturvedi and Maisoon, to just, if we, if you had to say one thing to the international community um, that's already discussing this topic from, from your country's perspective, what would that be? How do we make this movement more inclusive? And I'm giving all three of you um, ladies one minute exactly, because otherwise we will just be unceremoniously um, removed from this platform. So one minute and I will be timing you, um, Ms. Um, Sarah Beirous. Thank you very much. So I think that it's key here to have some synergy, to create synergy on an international level. Uh, in this case, with uh, with Mexico, this is going right uh, quite well. Also with Spain, Canada, Costa Rica, we are creating and developing a lot of synergy. I'm interested in creating more synergy with India and, of course, with Jordan, if this were possible. And because this, in turn, will actually help us in order to uh, exert further uh, force. And I was really identified when Christopher said that uh, in many countries cannot say that we have a feminist foreign policy. We cannot say that at this point in time because we don't really have one and because it would create lots of hindrances, lots of criticism. So we'd rather go step by step, uh, going for parity first, raising awareness on gender uh, perspective, or cross-sectionality of gender perspective across the ministries, and, and we will support on our colleagues and friends uh, for, um, for us to be able to go a little bit further towards uh, substantial equality and women's rights in all international fora. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, so synergy um, across countries. Uh, Maisoon, um, one one minute. Okay, I'm back. Thank you. Uh, we in Jordan, we have a very good policies. We have a very good legislation laws. The problem is with the culture. I think we have to. It's long longer road, road to, to to begin, but we have to work from the family. How the dad uh, treats his mom. How that son look at his girl's sister. 
uh, if you look at the curriculum of the school, you see uh, the woman, she's washing uh, dishes and the men reading newspaper. This is small things. When they talk about the good stories, they talk about the men. They never mention good success story of women. But this is the thing, how it changed. And we have a lot of very good, even when they write the quota, it's written that will not present the good woman. They play with the way that you see with the quota, uh, it represents each governorate that the way it's written uh, will give a bad, uh, let's say, image of the woman that they are participating or not a qualified, let's say, the woman. I would say it is a culture. It is a culture. We have to work hard with the women that they, they have to be confident. They have to believe in their strength. And again, they have to be, to be given opportunity to show the Jordanian women they are very good. It's not only parliament. If you have too many ministers, they can yeah. show yeah. that they are good enough. Thank you. Andrew. Absolutely. So, so as we understand, everybody needs uh, a thousand Christophers um, in their country. Uh, Dr. Christopher, you're very much in demand. Um, things, um, you know, culture, social norms, things we know very well in India, uh, Ms. Chaturvedi. Um, one thing you want to tell the international community so that this movement going forward is more inclusive. Absolutely. When we talk about a feminist foreign policy, what we're trying to say is the perspective, the change of perspective that foreign policy brings when you keep women at the forefront. And when we talk about women, I'm sure the first thing that comes to everyone's mind is equality. What comes into mind is empathy. What comes into mind is inclusiveness. So the, it, it's only a plus, plus and more plus if we have more women-centric discussions and women at the center uh, with, with uh, opinions that they can share and with decisions that they can make. So all I'd like to say is India, uh, of course, has its, uh, there, there are a bit of negatives when you look at the statistics, but in terms of uh, being able to be vocal, being able to prioritize this agenda is something which uh, will create a platform uh, which will have more women in such spaces. And most importantly, uh, uh, when we speak about networks, when we speak about building networks uh, across nations, we need to build networks within the nation to be able to rise above as a gender. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That I think is very important, especially when it comes to a hugely diverse country um, like India, where there's many, many things going on. Um, well, I want to say from my side, thank you very much to all our panelists. Um, I will invite Lyric to, to sort of close the session and put out some of the key takeaways um, and uh, to let everyone know all of this has happened with the gracious support of ICRW. We would not have been able to have this panel without her. So thank you very much, Lyric, um, if we do get cut off unceremoniously. <laughs> and thank you, Ambika, and to all of our hosts um, at Fundacion Fame and Kuberian Initiative. We're just so thrilled to be a part of this conversation as it's very much a, a, our goal in this work as we study the evolving field of feminist foreign policy to disrupt some of these myths, one of which is that this is just a tool of the global north, and we are so thrilled um, to support this conversation and to share it out and to amplify these important messages and perspectives. Some brief common themes, and of course, thanks to our speakers for these, just to recap for you, um, I'll first quote the honorables um, Anna Amelia Sarah Brius, who said that parity and representation is important and obviously an indicator that gets focused on a lot in this, in this conversation. But feminist foreign policy demands that we break those barriers. It's not just about parity, but the policy itself has to be built from a feminist perspective. It's about equality and bringing down hierarchies. And so that's everything from the process to the product and the journey that you've all emphasized that each of your countries are on a different, uh, a different time on this journey over time. And to encourage ourselves to know that no one ever lands on perfection. Saying one is going to do a feminist foreign policy is signaling one's intent to strive harder, to reach farther, to hold ourselves to certain ideals, both at home and abroad, um, but that it will be a continual process of learning and doing that by building the ranks and the diversity of voices, both in government working on these issues, but also working with our fellow activists and academics and thinkers in civil society to ensure that nothing is about us without us. 
Um, we had a lot of conversation on domestic and foreign policy coherence, which is very important piece of the framework that I have shared in the chat, um, which has been co-created and constructed with a number of the partners that you've heard from today. We get in there a bit on the question of whether to call something feminist and land that not all policies need to be called feminist, but if you are going to take that step, it's signaling a higher level of ambition, inviting, as Dr. Baina said, scrutiny and a conversation about that. And that really where we want to go is to feminist plus, which I think was also Dr. Baina's word, um, not just about women's rights, not just about gender, but how are we using this as a tool to disrupt those hierarchies, to transform power relations, and to be able to say at the end of that implementation process, which of course never ends, um, what changed? That is probably the single most important theme that we have heard in our work over various years of studying this in various contexts with all countries who have done this and those countries who have not is it's more than just showing up at CSW. It's more than giving a speech on International Women's Day. One has to be very clear about what one seeks to change in one's policy and practice, and then set a transparent roadmap to get there. So you've all given us so much to discuss. We are grateful for your time and your talents um, and for this evolving um, community of solidarity and practice uh, we would like to invite you to join us in this community of practice. We will be formalizing this uh, collective via the Generation Equality Forum process, which Mexico will host the kickoff uh, at the end of the month, and then will land in uh, France in the summer. So stay tuned for more. We will uh, share resources and opportunities to collaborate to continue to improve. Thank you all. Thank you, Lyric. Um, just to reiterate, the Lyric has put the link in the chat box of the framework. Um, we are also looking into the framework and how we may contribute to that from an Indian perspective um, and, um, and what uh, we need to do within India to sort of bring this whole movement across. So I have to say, Dr. Christopher um, and Ms. Sarah Virus, your experiences are very valuable and we'll definitely be reaching out to you to learn more about that. Um, uh, I wanna thank all our four panel members for speaking and taking the time um, so early in the morning, all the way in Latin America and quite this late um, in the evening in India. Um, by soon, I think you had um, the perfect timing in that sense. Um, thank you very much everyone and um, for this panel and thank you to all our attendees um, who asked many, many questions, but I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to all of them. All right, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.